So, Sir Paul, uh, 43 years later, here you are back at the Olympia in Paris. Can you please briefly tell us what you've been doing since uh, all that time? <laughs> Making music mm -hmm. is the short answer. Successfully? Having fun. Mm -hmm. Successfully? I, yes, most of it's been pretty successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, I'm a big star <laughs> in America. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm a big star now. <laughs> No, it was great. You know what happened? I saw the film La Vie en Rose, uh -huh. and I liked it. Yeah. And there's a scene where uh, uh, Piaf is, is singing at the Olympia. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, man, I've played there with the Beatles. So it just, it just made me want to play there mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Well, you may not believe or not, but uh, I was at the Olympia in 64. I was uh, nine years old. You must have been little. Yes, nine mm -hmm. years old. And uh, a cousin of mine uh, took me there because she was a fan of Sylvie Vartan. So oh, yeah. I can remember Sylvie Vartan, mm. she was blonde, she mm -hmm. was singing out of key. Very pretty. But I remember the Beatles very well. Uh, what are your memories of the, those concerts? Um, well, we thought the French were mad, mm -hmm. basically. Um, w number one, the actual concert itself was boys. And we'd never played to an audience of boys. Mm -hmm. We had girls. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was good. Mm. These were suddenly boys. And the girls screamed, and these boys, oh, yeah, no, no, no. actually, there was a girl. Was, mm. you, was your cousin a girl? Mm, yes, she was a girl. Oh, well, yeah, that's yeah. probably the only I, I, girl. I, I, I was, was screaming too. Seemed like a lot mm. of boys. And then the police, the gendarmes, were beating these boys up mm -hmm. for standing up. We're <laughs> going, no, no, please, you know. So that was a, a memory. And then backstage, we thought it was very crazy. We always, it was just like a sort of sacred place mm -hmm. everywhere else. Mm. But in France, you know, since in France, since the revolution, you know, everyone can go everywhere. But you so it was like, wah! It was like outside the door, we'd say, no, no, photographers, mm -hmm. please get them away. So, we can't. Mm -hmm. They're there, you know. So, but it was great. We, it was lovely. We got used to it pretty fast. And me and John had been on a special visit to Paris before. Mm -hmm. So it was a nice return to Paris, mm -hmm. which we'd always loved. But you said somewhere that uh, there were a lot of boys at the Olympia concert because of the cover of uh, that song by the Shirelles that mm. Ringo was singing, you know, mm. boys. Mm. Boys, yeah. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, no, we, <coughs> you know, uh, people used to kind of complain about uh, pop song lyrics and they'd say, oh, you know, some of them are mm. a bit naughty and Elvis Presley's dancing is sexy. We never saw that. We were, mm -hmm. you mean, mm -hmm. sexy? And it, it, we hadn't thought of that. So, boys, it was just a good tune. And nobody thought anything of, of Ringo going, oh, I'm talking about <laughs> boys. <laughs> but the, we never realized a boy talking about boys might be misconstrued. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just a good song. So we didn't worry about that, you know. But um, it was good. He did it great. It was good. He was uh, good to him. Uh, as you just said, the first time you, you came to France was in 61 with John, uh, mm. but I, by that time you didn't speak any French at all, so did you manage to survive? Yeah, we, we survived. Um, we didn't have any hotels booked, we'd hitchhiked mm. across. And we were actually going to Spain, but we liked Paris so much that we stayed, and we forgot about Spain. Mm. But we were actually heading for Spain through Paris, because um, John had been given 100 pounds by a rich relative, which I still maintain is a lot of money yes, it is. For, a, for a present, you know, it's like, that's good, 100 pounds. Anyway, but so this was like we'd won the, the football pools, mm -hmm. um, the lottery or something, you know. And um, yeah, so we didn't know any, he was supposed to know a little bit of French because mm -hmm. he'd done it in school, mm -hmm. I hadn't, mm -hmm. but he did, turned out he didn't know any. We knew bonjour, merci. And then we got, we went to Montmartre and time was running out. We didn't have a hotel, and it was getting late. So we were up in Montmartre, and um, we saw these women walking up and down a lot. So we said, we'll ask one of them. We said, avez-vous un hotel pour la nuit? Mm -hmm. So the 100 pounds were used. Avez-vous? <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually thought that we were so young and beautiful that one of these women would take us back <laughs> to her hotel pour la nuit. And did they it didn't. No? no, they didn't. Mm. I'm afraid they didn't. We, we had to find a little <laughs> flea-bitten hotel. But, uh, and we got bitten. You, you said you were impressed at some point by a, a French waitress because mm. she had hair under her arm. Yeah. We had never seen that. Really? I mean, you don't see that, you know. And she, 
I mean, we thought she was like very old and very mature because we were, uh, John was 21, so that would mean I would be about 19. So she was probably 27. Mm. You know, but it looked very old and very mature. And she looked very beautiful. She, she probably wasn't, but she was French. And, she, and we said, avez-vous un van ordinaire, s'il vous plaît? She gave us this terrible red stuff. And went, Ooh, vinegar. You know, we, that put us off wine for many, many years. <laughs> And, but as she handed it to us, she had like hair and her, oh, whoa, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> the, it brought out the animal in us. Mm. And um, I can remember it clearly to this day. But speaking about hair, uh, you had this friend, Jorgen Vollmer from mm. Hamburg, mm. who was in Paris and who, uh, who designed your haircut. Mm. Uh, and it was, uh, it was coming from a Jean Cocteau film, you know? Yeah. Testament d'Orphée. Yeah, I it was so. a Jean Marais haircut. Yeah. Uh, wa uh, was it a French way to uh, to to uh, to help in the making of the Beatles? It was. Yeah, it was. It was a big help. I mean, we knew Jürgen from Hamburg, mm -hmm. and he was a good friend of ours. And we just ran into him on the street. Jürgen, Paris. So we went, uh, we went for coffee or something, talking away. Um, he had his hair sort of like this, you know, it's like mm -hmm. later you'd see Paul Weller in the jam with yeah, that yeah. one, you know, that early jam thing. And um, we said, can you cut our hair like yours? And he said, no, 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 no. Because he liked all the mm -hmm. rocker, he liked mm -hmm. the, the leather, mm -hmm. he liked that stuff. He, mm -hmm. That's what he took pictures of, so he liked us like that. We said, no, 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 please, please. And he said, no, no. In the end, he did it and he cut it. And... Um, that was the, the beginning of the Beatle haircut. Mm. We went back to Liverpool, everyone, <laughs> it's, it's good, this is good. Mm. This is modern, it's new. <laughs> Bloody hell. Uh, Nobody was very impressed, but um, <laughs> it caught on. In 65, by, by the time of Michel, uh, you said that sometimes you were pretending to be French just to pull up girls. Mm. Uh, how did it work? Like, for example, pretend I'm yeah, a French girl, no. what, what, what would you say? Well, you know, it was a time of uh, Juliette Greco, mm -hmm. and they all, uh, the, the Paris scene and the French scene, would wear black, and she had long black hair. Mm -hmm. She looked very sultry, Something Juliette, like you know? Mm -hmm. And we were like, oh, fancied her like man. Had no idea whether she had hair under the arms. <laughs> this didn't matter. I can tell. <laughs> we still don't know to this day. I can check when I'm back. Please check. <laughs> Please check on that one. Um, but so we used to really like that sort of French beat yeah, scene. Yeah. You know, it, it was uh, bohemian. We thought it was very bohemian. So when I went to these art school parties, John went to art school. So he was a little bit older than me and George. Mm -hmm. So I would go wearing the black and then take a guitar, sit in the corner. <laughs> No, I couldn't speak it, but I could sound like, like it. it. Yeah. And then I and I had this song, ding 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 ding, do de do, that I used to play mm -hmm. enigmatically in the corner, yeah. <laughs> hoping that women would come over and say, "You're French, you're mine," but it never happened. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> no, it did never happen. But then years later, John said, "You know that daft French song you used mm -hmm. to do?" He said that wasn't bad. That he said you should finish that up. Mm -hmm. So I did, and it became Michelle. Well, enough of France and girls. Uh, let's go back. To Can we get enough of France and girls? No, never. But uh, never. <laughs> let's no, go no, back no. To, 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 to serious matters. Apart from people like, let's say, uh, George Clooney or uh, Barry Hilton, you may be one of the most interviewed people on this planet. Do you still get uh, some pleasure doing interviews? Is it still pleasant? Yeah, you know, Peter Ustinov once said, I like doing interviews, it allows me to know what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And there is some element of truth in that. Yeah. Sometimes people will you know, remind you, like you reminded me of the French waitress. And I wouldn't think about that today otherwise. Yeah. So it's quite nice, you just, oh yeah. So I, I quite like it. Depends yeah. on the interviewer. Yeah, yeah. If it's interesting, then it's good. For example, are there any questions that you're getting bored to be asked? Like, I think last year, uh, how does it feel to be 64 at last? Mm. Yeah, you know, there's certain subjects I don't want to go there, mm -hmm. like, you know, divorce. Mm -hmm. I have, we have a um, little baby, so I don't think it's good to, to, to get into the private life. Mm -hmm. so, so I always avoid that. Mm -hmm. um, normally, the sort of most 
sort of boring questions are, what is your favorite Beatles song? Mm -hmm. You go, uh, 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 uh. And, you know, you, you actually end up getting a pat answer. Yeah. yeah. You go, it's, it's yesterday, yeah. <laughs> because I dreamed it. Uh. You know, but it's, it's not necessarily true. Uh. There's a lot of songs I like better than that, but that, that's a pretty boring one. Uh -huh. And then the other boring one is, are there any questions you haven't ever been asked? Yeah. So tell me about your divorce. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, Let me tell no, you. I, I, <laughs> actually, I want to Three go back on, on when I'm 64, because uh, two years ago you wrote that song, uh, that song English Tea, uh, and we, mm. you talk about cricket, roses, mm. Uh, mm. Uh, cakes. Mm. Uh, could, you, uh, could we look at it as an ironic uh, follow-up to when I'm 64, somehow? It's in the same vein, yeah. Mm. Um, uh, the tune to When I'm 64, I had when I was 16 years old. Mm. Da -da 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 -da. I had no words. Yeah. But then when we did Sgt. Pepper, I thought, that's an okay tune, but I need, the lyrics need to be so tongue-in-cheek, you know, it needs to be interesting. So mm. then I came up with the idea of When I'm 64, not realizing mm -hmm. I would be 64 mm -hmm. one day, mm -hmm. and that song would get brought back. I would be... <laughs> beaten with it um so that was that and then english tea yeah it's in the same vein i like that englishness mm. i like that I, I like it's kind of the movies i used to watch when i was a kid um that's sort of very sophisticated like fred astaire mm -hmm. no card mm -hmm. du bois mm -hmm. <laughs> tea and stuff it's the kind of thing i like i mean it, i've never it's never existed anywhere i lived Mm. But it's on the films, and it's kind of this idea of Britishness. And um, I wrote the song because I'd, I knew somebody who talked like that. There's an old lady nearby where I live. Would you care to take some tea? You know, mm. my people would say, do you want a cup of tea? Mm -hmm. But she said, would you care to take some tea? And I became interested in the way mm -hmm. she said those things. It was kind of elegant. Mm. So I wrote the song, you know. Would you care to take some tea? I'm thinking no card would have done it very well. <laughs> Dear boy. Uh, as you just said, you were 16 when you wrote uh, When I'm 64. Mm. Were you disappointed not to lose your hair or to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be wasted away? No, it's, um, now I was, uh, when I became 64, I just checked through the lyrics, how much is coming true, you know, <laughs> like, uh, yeah. And so? <laughs> and there were plenty of things, you know. Well, it's strange. Uh, we won't go there. You, you still uh, write a lot of music, a lot of songs. Uh, do, does it come as easy as in the past? Because I remember I'm you very sing lucky. songs where... Like yeah, I, I'm very lucky. Yeah. I'm from a generation where you, you were kind of expected to write things quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, would ring us up, ring John and I up and say, you've got a week off next week. we go, yay! Mm -hmm. He said, and you can write the new album. Mm -hmm. we go, yay! Whereas you tell that to young bands and it yeah. frightens them. A week to write the new album. Mm -hmm. But, so we, we did things very quickly. We, we wrote a song a day. So I'm very lucky that still um, able to do that. Yeah. They don't. They're not all uh, uh, finished in a day, yeah. but it's it's something that I I'm very lucky. I don't I don't really get writer's blocks. But you think it's only about being lucky? You you never wonder where where it comes from. Well, you know they you know they say you create your own mm. luck, and I think that's true. But I also think uh, I am lucky. I think mm. uh, I think a lot of things that have happened to me. The kind of thing that you you could say I created it, but waking up one morning mm -hmm. with this tune that was yesterday mm -hmm. i think that's pretty lucky i suppose you could make a case well you learned everything you learned yeah. and your brain computed it and printed it out uh -huh. but i would still would call it luck you know so and I, i'm sorry to to go back to michelle uh, and i know it's a, a very asked question but uh, as you said in the barry miles book uh, it's something that came up in a dream and that you had to verify that it was not already in existence. In uh, these, uh, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday, 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 yesterday yeah. sorry. Uh, did it ever happen again since? No. Uh, there, there, were, there have been a couple of dreams. I, I did a song called No Values, which was in um, 
the film Give More Guys to Broad Street, mm -hmm. which was not very successful. Mm -hmm. So the song's largely forgotten. But that came from a dream that where I saw the Stones doing it. Mm -hmm. I saw the Rolling Stones singing a song. Yeah. And I woke up and I thought, that was good. Then I thought, what was that song? You know, and I remembered half of it. But it wasn't as magical as the yesterday dream because yeah. I remembered the whole thing with yesterday and it just was, it was there. So I, you know, they, they talk about the gift of music. I think that was a gift. Yeah, yeah. Did you have the feeling that you have touched like a golden uh, number, like, mm. you know? Mm. The, the it's funny, yeah, I, I really did, I really, did. well, I have to think that yeah. because it's been recorded by over 3,000 mm. people, including Frank Sinatra, yeah, Elvis yeah. Presley, Marvin Gaye, Ray Charles. I mean, right there, mm -hmm. to have those people do anything of mine. Mm -hmm. But then there's another 2,996 mm -hmm. people <laughs> who have recorded it. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, for something I dreamed, that's pretty yeah. phenomenal. So, um, yeah, so, so I, I feel and blessed. You know, th these songs, they mean so much. Um, do you sometimes look at the, the Beatles' le legacy as a burden, as something that you have to share with the people, even if you would like to go somewhere else or I know what you mean uh, I don't really because it's there mm. and you know to think of it as a burden makes your life impossible yeah so I don't like that you know anything mm. for an easy life with me um, and mm. I, I actually f find that I I like to reminisce about the Beatles there was a period when we were starting wings mm -hmm. when I said no we're not going to talk about the Beatles because that's all you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. We must talk about Wings. But once we got Wings established, um, and I'd done Band on the Run, and we'd established it as its own thing, mm -hmm. then, I, then I started to feel free. And now I feel very free to talk about anything. And so with, with John and George no longer with us, it's beautiful to recall the times when they were. Yeah. 37 years after the breakup of the Beatles, are you amazed to, uh, to see up to what point this music has been influenced? I think it's very rare for a musician to measure this mm -hmm. up, you know, while, while being uh, still alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it, it is phenomenal. And the nice thing is I can look at it a bit objectively because mm -hmm. the Beatles' career is finished. So it's a body of work, yeah, yeah, like yeah, Picasso's. Yeah. So you can look at it and think, oh, they did that. They started then, they finished then. Mm. Um, no, I really do think it was incredible. And, you know, perhaps there's some way that I should be a bit more modest and sort of dimple shyly and say, oh, we did okay. Mm -hmm. But, no, we did more than okay. Mm -hmm. We were, we were shit hot, <laughs> as we say. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Merde show. Makes sense. <laughs> is that what it is? Merde show, yeah, Merde show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we were pretty cool, man. Merde brûlante. Brûlante. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, no, we, we just were, and I can say it now. Yeah. You know, when we were with the Beatles, you couldn't really yeah. say it. It was just be yeah. too conceited. But I think that the four of us did some very special yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah. And I, now I sing some of the Beatles songs, and I hear them as I'm singing them. I think, this is well constructed. Mm -hmm. This is good to sing. It's mm -hmm. no wonder people like it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm allowed to see th how good it is now, yeah. whereas there was a time when I had to... Now I, I can say anything, as I just yeah. did. Something like, as, uh, I'm really amazed with about you is that you've been through uh, terrible times. I mean, mm. you lost your mother when you were mm. 14, breakup of Beatles, a lawsuit that followed, then you, you, you lost your friend, your wife, and still uh, you have a lot of energy and you mm. remain you know, a lot, very much into life. Mm. Uh, where do you think that comes from? I don't know, you know, I, I, I've always been very enthusiastic mm -hmm. Um, about life um, and you're right you know I have had some terrible tragedies and I, I I do think from time to time I think it should have knocked me out you know this should have really and for the time that those tragedies occurred it did knock me out mm -hmm. um, but for instance when Linda died I just did nothing really for, for probably about a year I probably just cried for a year mm -hmm. so and I was able to then pick up the pieces. And music is what saved me. Mm -hmm. You know, music is the great healer, the great savior. And so um, I was able to come back with uh, the, the energy and the enthusiasm, I think because of music. 
I think so. And also, you know, you have to rationalize it. I talk to people who've lost loved ones. Mm. I say, they would want you to be strong. Mm. There's no loved one who passes away. We want, oh, I want you to be weak. I want you to go down the neck. I want you to, your life to be ruined as well. Mm. So I, I took that as a great strength. I said, you know, I know Linda would want me to be strong. And I know John, George, my dad, mm. and mom would, um, would want you to be like that. So I rationalize it a bit. And then I say, with music and my natural enthusiasm, I seem to keep thinking the world is a good place. Mm. You were made a, a sir, like 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, why did you, what did you choose to put on your armorial? A uh, Hoffner bass. <laughs> <laughs> serious? Yeah, serious. I, it's not anything I use, but they, it comes with the thing, you know, a guy writes to you, would you like a coat of arms, you know, yeah. shield? Yeah. And you can't say no. <laughs> She said, yeah. He said, well, what do you want on it? A deer, a stag, maybe, a base, a flower. I've got, it. I've got one somewhere. I don't use it. I should have a badge. Oh, yeah, you should, yeah. should put, wear a little badge. On your vest. No, you know, the best thing about it, well, there are a lot of good things about it. And I was a bit embarrassed at the time, but uh, my kids loved it. Mm. My kids were very proud. My family, uh, Linda and my family, were mm. very proud. So that, that was good for me. Um, but you, you go to the palace, you know, and Her Majesty, mm -hmm. the, the Queen of England, dude, she sort of, you know, you, you bend, you kneel down. She takes this big sword, and you have to trust mm -hmm. in the Queen. Mm. She could do anything. <laughs> you know, what if she just suddenly threw a wobbler? Mm. Yeah, I never like you. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't. And you have to trust, and she picks the sword up, and, you know, arise, Sir yeah, Paul. Yeah, yeah. And it's the sword of Edward the Confessor. Uh -huh. So that, I found that quite amazing. That's very historical. If that sword could talk, <laughs> the stories it had up. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, was, it was a great honor. And I, and I took it like a fantastic sort of school prize. Slightly embarrassing when people call me Sir <laughs> now, you know. And I notice you haven't groveled. No, I didn't. You, haven't, you should be kneeling oh, during right this interview. Now. I think this might be... You want me to stay like this? Until I think this is good. I rather like this, yes. Continue. Right. Carry yeah. on. Uh, in your book with Barry Miles, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you confess that uh, Bob Dylan introduced you to, uh, to Pot. Yeah. You introduced Mick Jagger to Pot. Yes, you... I, so you I understand, yeah. yeah. So is it something you, you would recommend today? Or? No, 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 no. Not at all. No, no, natural high. Oh. High on life. But uh, Mick Jagger... It was the times. Yes, okay, okay. It, it, was, was, it, was, it was another time. <laughs> but Mick Jagger himself, who is himself a sir, right? Mm. Sir Mick Jagger. Mm. When you're having dinner together, what do you talk about? Is it uh, pot stories, sir stories? What with Mick? Oh, yeah? No. I mean, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> you don't really talk about that. I think I was just being asked about the whole subject once, and I, mm. so I naturally brought up the fact that Bob... Mm. I think Bob's a bit embarrassed about it now, I heard. Oh, yeah? So, yeah, I don't know. You know, you, you know the truth is you don't want to influence kids. Mm. Now I've got, I've got yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. a young kid. You get the responsibility. And you don't want to say, hey, come on, kids. Mm. It's great. Mm. You, you, you're a little more mature, so it seems okay for you to do it at the time. Mm -hmm. Now I would take a bit more sensible approach and mm. just think, I really do think it's better to be naturally high and clean actually like me you know I, I actually do think that's better but in those times we were we were different okay i try to remember that so there is a, a very beautiful song on your last record called uh, the end of the end uh, mm. where you talk about your own ending mm. and lyrics goes it's a start of a journey to a much better place mm. you mean better than england <laughs> yeah it's it's basically the start of a journey to france <laughs> good or spain through France, yeah, that's what it is. It's a much better place, Paris. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean it's a much more serious song. I know it's Please, a serious song. Please, pull yourself you together. It's a serious You've song. You've been smoking that pot again, <laughs> haven't you? <laughs> no, I gave up oh, good. a few years ago. So the, do you strongly believe in it, that it's, it will be the start of a new journey? Yeah, I think so. You know, it's, I, don't, I'm not, I don't have any very strong beliefs. It's mm -hmm. all a guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I have a feeling um, 
you know, I think what's interesting now is like science is, is sort of catching up with religion. Mm -hmm. So all these quantum physics, the idea that we are made of the same molecules that stars are made of, mm -hmm. is, I, think, I think that is quite, you know, astounding. Mm -hmm. You know, that we're made of the same stuff as this chair. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would have never believed that. So it gives me perhaps reason to believe that there's something else um, other than Paris. <laughs> It may be a better place, but it's a complete guess. And you also say in the song that you wish people will sing your songs all over, which eventually will happen, of course, and that jokes will be told. Mm, that would be good. Anyone in particular? Oh, jokes? Mm -hmm. uh, do you really want me to tell you a joke? No, if you want to people to tell jokes. Oh, uh, own, people can well. tell any jokes they yeah. think of. Any jokes, whatever makes them laugh and smile. Now, you know, the tradition of an Irish wake mm -hmm. is more appealing to me than a very sort of Anglican... No, I think that's a little bit sort of down. Mm -hmm. um, so I like the idea... Hey, hey, yeah, hey. It's, it's more fitting for me, I think. And they can tell any jokes they want, including dirty ones. All right. Thanks a lot, sir.